Hey, good afternoon or morning to everybody wherever you are. Thanks for clicking on to this video. My name is John Roach from the Maryland Dam Safety Program and we're here to talk about some of the big changes coming to small ponds starting January 1st, 2023. So what are these big changes you've been hearing about? Let's give a little background to start off. As you likely know in the state of Maryland, a dam safety permit issued by MDE is required in order to construct, reconstruct, or repair any reservoir dam or waterway obstruction. Now that being said, Environment Article 5-503 allows that certain small ponds may be exempt from the requirement to obtain the permit from MDE, provided that small pond approval is issued by the appropriate Soil Conservation District, SCD, or the department's designee. Now, in a these plans must be reviewed for technical compliance in accordance with COMAR 2617.04.05, which includes references to the NRCS MD378 standards and specifications for ponds, which we all know and lovingly refer to as Pond Code 378 or MD 378. The plans must also be reviewed for technical compliance with MDE's policies and procedures. Now that is a relatively new uh, portion of COMAR. And I just want to step back a little bit and make a refresher for those of you who aren't aware. MDE po publishes a number of policies and procedure documents on our dam safety website. And what these do is they serve to clarify, further explain sections of MD 378 where we've determined language to be potentially ambiguous, potentially in conflict with itself. It also helps to fill in the gaps where MD 378 sometimes doesn't address certain items. Now these policies and procedures will someday be wound up into a new MD 378 or similar document, but until that time, it's our expectation that everybody will design their small ponds in accordance with Pond Code 378, as well as these policies and procedures. Now, over time, the SCDs have lost professional engineering staff capable of performing small pond reviews. That's a broad generalization, of course. There are some districts with some wonderful engineers on staff who are more than capable of performing small pond reviews. But as a statewide trend and even a national trend, a lot of the PE staff who dealt with small ponds have left the NRCS, whether that be through retirement or moving to a private sector or other entity. Over the many years where we've enjoyed this symbiotic relationship between the dam safety program and the SCDs, relationships have evolved a little bit to fill this void on loss of staff. The NRCS state engineers have stepped in to provide technical assistance for many of those districts where they didn't have adequate uh, trained or licensed staff on hand. In January 2021, the NRCS issued Bulletin 210-2101. In this bulletin, the NRCS state level at Maryland indicated that they will no longer provide technical review for stormwater management pond designs. Now, I think what they really meant to say is more likely they are no longer going to be providing review for non-agricultural small pond designs, because as we all know, there's not just ag and stormwater, there's also recreation, irrigation, and a whole other uh, variety of types of ponds that may be out there. This bulletin also indicated that delegated job approval authority, which is basically a way of indicating NRCS or SCD staff who uh, either through qualifications or time on the job have sufficient knowledge to review and approve small ponds, it, st it struck that small pond job approval authority. It also nullified any existing districts that MOUs may have had there were a number of districts that had a memorandum of understanding 
perhaps with uh, their partner DPW or Stormwater Review Agency in that county, whereby that other agency may perform the small pond reviews with the approvals still issued by the district. And all of this came into effect January 1, 2022. So we had as a state about a year, a little bit less than a year, to figure out what are we going to do to handle this vacuum that the changes proposed in this issue bulletin created. Now we engaged MDE with the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, the State Soil Conservation Committee, NRCS, and many of you are partners at the SCDs to figure out, get a deeper understanding of your policies and procedures, your strengths, your weaknesses, your needs, and how we could step in to help fill that void. At the end of the day, small pond approvals are going to be completed by MDE where the SCDs don't have the ability to perform that review on their own. But that's not an enjoyable situation, both for MDE or the districts or the development and engineering community as well. At the end of the day, it's our desire at MDE to ensure that the districts are appropriately equipped to perform a small pond reviews moving forward. So where do we stand today, the fall of 2022? About, as the time of this recording, 11 months since this change has been in effect. Well, things don't necessarily move as fast as we'd like, particularly when they're a complicated issue. And as I just mentioned, we did a lot of learning, listening, and outreach to understand what MDE could do to better support the districts in the absence of NRCS. Here are four things that we feel like we learned. Our discussions reinforce the need for revised and clear guidance for designers and applicants. We felt there's a greater need for MDE involvement and understanding with how each district works. We've heard loud and clear that MD-378 and other technical guidance is in need of update. MD-378 was last updated 22 years ago. And particularly in the new world of stormwater management that we see right now, it simply doesn't meet the state of the practice. There are significant voids and gaps that need to be addressed. And lastly, the districts and the design community, all of those engineers out there, need technical support. So again, we've worked over the past year, now to almost two years, to determine the best path forward. In August of 2022, MDE issued our small pond approval policy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that whole must be reviewed in accordance with MD 378 and the department's policies and procedures we see that this small pond approval policy is essentially equivalent to a regulation. This policy, first and foremost, affirms MDE's support of the districts to approve small ponds. It then lays out expectations for qualifications of technical reviewers and approvers that's meant to equal the qualifications of the NRC staff who previously performed these reviews. Now, it also sets up a framework for SCDs to bring in third parties to support that review. So where a district may not have technical staff at hand or may find it very difficult to hire that kind of staff directly, these third parties, such as, again, your local partner agencies in your county or even a private engineering firm can sign up to do that review so that the districts can do the approval. The approval policy also discusses a new cold water review process, and I will touch on that a little bit more because it's important to ensure that we protect the thermal regime and water quality of some of our most valuable streams throughout the state. The approval policy restates many existing COMAR requirements, such as small pond summary sheet submissions, uh, back to MDE on a quarterly basis, 
to show to us what has been approved and what's been built. And lastly, in a stopgap for the MDE 378 update, it once again reinforces uh, and makes it clear that the districts can and should adapt our policy memos, including our hazard classification guidance, as a stopgap for future updates to Maryland Pond Code 378. Now, we sent this approval policy to the districts on August 19th, received a little bit of feedback, and then sent an email to our statewide email list on September 8th. That email list contains dam owners, dam engineers, districts, and many other people involved in the dam and small pond community in Maryland. And if you're not signed up for that and receiving those emails, please reach out to your dam safety contacts and we can ensure you're at it. The idea is this final small pond approval policy will go into effect January 1st, 2023. And that's one of the reasons why we're recording this presentation today and posting it online so that you can get the information you need to ensure that your designs will comply with the new policies when it goes into effect. So what's new in these policies? Well, first of all, the SCD will designate a technical reviewer. Now that technical reviewer, again, may be a staff member. It may be through a memorandum of understanding with a county agency or a third party engineer. That technical reviewer will sign something called a technical review affidavit once they are satisfied with the design. This affidavit basically states that Joe Smith or Jane Smith, the engineer, has reviewed the plans, reports, and analyses and agrees that they are in compliance with the Pond Code 378 and the department's policies and procedures. All designs must incorporate these policies and procedures, especially and including our dam breach and hazard classification guidance. To be quite frank, the simplified dam breach analysis found in MD 378 is simply not up to snuff these days, particularly given the complex hydrology and hydraulics that can exist in urban situations. Sure, it may work for small ponds in very rural areas where a low hazard classification is almost a given, but most of what's being built and approved these days is much more complicated, and we need to go at the dam breach analysis and hazard classification with a little more uh, rigor than we previously have. I mentioned previously the cold water guidance and provisions in this document. We've set forth a guidance document that we developed in partnership with the Department of Natural Resources that discusses the best practices for preventing thermal degradation of cold water resource ponds. So ponds within these cold water mapped areas, and that's all defined in the guidance and policy memo, must comply if the district is going to approve it. Now, if there's a reason, for example, if you absolutely need to have a wet pool, a permanent wet pool in a cold water resource area, then that will require MDE permitting because what we'll need to do is consult with DNR and the designer to find out if there are opportunities left on the table or opportunities to improve the design to ensure that we do not degrade the quality of the stream. We've provided a design review checklist. It's draft right now, we're hoping to finalize it, but we feel that this is going to be so beneficial both for the districts and the design community. On the district side and on the MDE side as well, this is what we'll be doing to ensure that what's been submitted to us meets all the necessary requirements and that all the documentation is there. On the design side, we're hoping that this will allow you to demystify and understand better exactly what it is we'll be looking for and checking. So that way, there's no wasted efforts, there's no scope busts or scope creep, we can create a lot more efficient process is our hope. We've also launched a new pond summary sheet. We're not calling it the MD14 summary sheet anymore, simply a pond summary sheet. It's now two pages. It has additional information 
but what we have found is that the old pond summary sheets simply didn't contain the right information that we needed to record to maintain an adequate small pond database in the state of Maryland. So we've modified it, we've added some information so that we can create a robust database of all the small ponds that exist within this state. We've also provided a template small pond approval document with conditions and an operation and maintenance plan. Now, each district can customize this approval document as they see fit. You're more than welcome to add contingencies and conditions, but we'd like to see that the conditions laid out in the approval are at least met at a minimum. A lot of these conditions are, to be quite frank, just compliance with existing parts of the state laws and regulations such as, hey, you need an approved sediment and erosion control plan if you're going to disturb significant areas. Or, hey, we can't operate heavy equipment within a waterway without approvals. The O&M plan largely modeled on some examples we've seen from, if I remember correctly, Prince George's, St. Mary's, and Charles counties, is a document that can be provided with the approval so that the pond owner will know what their responsibilities are going forward. As we can all know, a pond owner who's well informed and understands their duties will keep the structure in better shape over the long term and avoid costly repairs or potential even failures due to a lack of maintenance. One of the things we heard a lot in our listening sessions over the past years has been the as-built process doesn't work well. And there's some elements of that that we can't fix from the small pond side. I'll give an example. In some cases, a developer may get their uh, a bond approved and their sign-offs for the as-builts from the stormwater management side of the house. Well, we don't require bonds for small ponds from the soil conservation district side. So sometimes they may not submit the developer may not submit a complete submission because what's the point? They've already received their bond back and some approvals. Why spend the extra money? Well, we can all appreciate, I think, in the design and review and approval community that we do need adequate as-built documentation. So we've got an as-built submission checklist, once again, to reinforce to the designers, to the constructors and to the owners and developers, these are the things that need to be checked and documented during construction so that we can all collectively ensure that the structures that are built are safe and perform as intended. Lastly, part of that as-built submission issues we've heard from folks is that there was complications about, well, should the district uh, be the persons who sign and say the as-built and construction was adequate and complete. Well, but the districts aren't necessarily charged with being on site all the time and inspecting the construction. So we're clarifying here, the language in Comar allows for the design engineer to complete the project and submit the uh, a statement certifying that the project was constructed appropriately. So what we're going to be moving forward and asking is that the engineer provide a project completion form and an as-built submission affidavit that once again says that we're providing all of the correct documentation and that based on our observations and our understandings of the construction, the structure appears to be, have been built in conformance with the approved plans and design. Okay, so as we roll this out, it's getting late in 2022 and we're now less than two months away from the release. This information is on the MDE website. This presentation was recorded. This presentation was originally given in September to our dam owners workshop and now we're recording it to distribute to an even broader audience. And we'll have two more outreach and Q&A sessions this fall and into the winter. We'll keep on working at this until we get it right. We'll accept feedback and adjust as necessary. At the end of the day, again, we want to ensure an efficient, repeatable, and understandable process for everybody throughout the state. We don't want to have a black box of submissions where ponds are designed. We hope that they'll be approvable 
It takes a long time and lots of back and forth to get them out. And then you move to a different county, let's say, and the expectations are different. I think we can all appreciate that having a consistent process that's understandable and repeatable throughout the state benefits us all. Now, I'm just going to reiterate here what some of those policies and procedures I've been talking about are. The ones that are colored in black are ones that are existing and on our website. Again, I'll mention the 20,000, excuse me, the 2018 Dam Breach Guidance and Hazard Classification Policy, our Small Pond Approval Policy, the Cold Water Design Guidance, and then some more technical things like super wide road embankments smart pond technology, how to handle utilities and dams, and most importantly, what types of activities do not require a permit or small pond approval. In the coming months, we'll be issuing, we hope, the remaining six policies to further augment and supplement MD-378 so that we're all working from the same playbook, both on the design, review, and approval side. Those planned policies and procedures include a document discussing riser and trash rack design, one that clarifies excavated ponds and what criteria need to be met to meet an excavated pond. In this day, we're seeing a lot of stormwater ponds, particularly ones that connect to closed storm drain systems, that's the last bullet, where it's a little questionable whether or not it's excavated or embankment pond, or a combination of the both. So we're clarifying this. We're also clarifying the cutoff trench statements in MD-378. You might think it's obvious, four feet deep, right? Well, that's not exactly the entire story. You see, MD-378 in another section says that if you don't provide cutoff trenches down to an impervious stratum, you must incorporate additional seepage control into the design. Now, we can't fix a document that easily, 378 that is, but we can clarify that cutoff trenches should extend to an impervious stratum, and that's what this document's going to discuss. The MD-378 construction, quote, specifications are also not without some issues. In some senses, the specifications are just additional design requirements, and in some areas, they simply don't cover all of the criteria that one should, should be aware of as they're constructing a pond. And it talks about soil types and lift thicknesses, right? But it doesn't talk about how many tests you should take and at what frequency and the like. It doesn't really talk about concrete that much and other items. So we've got this document, Best Practices for Construction, which is not exactly a specification, but it comes pretty close. And a good construction inspector should review this document to ensure that the pond is being constructed appropriately. And geosynthetics. We'll talk about the uses and the acceptable uses and the unacceptable ways that geosynthetics might be included in a dam con or pond construction. For example, a geosynthetic is perfectly acceptable as a separation barrier below a riprap in a plunge pool. But a geosynthetic is not acceptable if it's used to wrap around a filter sand or perforated pipe that's constructed as part of a filter diaphragm. We'll discuss that in more detail in this policy. This is one of my favorite quotes from Samuel Clemens, also known as Mark Twain. Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. What we're trying to say here is that we keep on rolling out these policies and procedures and these fixes to address a lot of the things that we hear from you and the design and review community as it pertains to small ponds and dams. If we tried to just make one perfect document, it would take forever. And in the meantime, we'd be stuck with documents that are perhaps inadequate or don't answer the questions that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll plan, we'll do, we'll check, and we'll adjust as we move this small pond policy process forward. All right, well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, in this recorded session, 
format, we don't have time to take questions from you all. But if you include them in the comments below or reach out to your dam safety staff member, we'll be sure to get back to you to answer your questions. There's some additional information out there that you can find on our website listed here. And we have an unofficial YouTube channel called Maintain or Drain, where you can find recorded dam owner workshops and a host of other information created both by MDE dam safety staff and by other professionals throughout the country. Lastly, I'd highly encourage folks to check out the Association of State Dam Safety Officials. We recently had our large annual conference here in Baltimore in September 2022. But the ASDSO provides a wealth of training, resources, and state and national advocacy for the dam safety community. There's sure to be something found on the website that can help you out as you go about your business in the dam world. So thank you very much for the time here. I'm happy to answer your questions. If you reach out by phone or email, you can reach me. If I can't answer the question, I'll pass it along to one of my colleagues to make sure that we get it out to you. I hope you have a wonderful day and we look forward to rolling out these big changes to small ponds with your cooperation on January 1st, 2023.